This is another in the excellent series of articles written by the authors Dennis Bernstein and Vince Bielski. Uh, there, many of their stories have been carried by the San Francisco Examiner here in the Bay Area. This particular article, however, was, in, uh, was carried in In These Times, specifically the issue of In These Times, uh, the week of April 15th through 21st of 1987. So April 15th through 21st, 87, In These Times, Vince Bielski and Dennis Bernstein. This article is headlined, A Whirlwind of Death Threats and Wild Accusations Swirls Around Contragate. A key figure in the covert arms supply network threatened a congressional witness with death if the witness did not sign an inflammatory statement against a U.S. senator and others investigating the Iran-Contra scandal, a congressional source told in these times. John Hull, an American with dual citizenship in Costa Rica, delivered the threat to Peter Glibbery, G-L-I-B-B-E-R-Y, a British mercenary. Glibbery is imprisoned in Costa Rica for his involvement with the Contras fighting the Nicaraguan government. On Sunday, March 29th, in the crowded visiting area of La Reforma prison in Costa Rica, Hull told Glibri he would be killed if he refused to sign an affidavit declaring that Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, Miami Public Defender John Matez, M-A-T-T-E-S, and American reporters Tony Avigan and Martha Honey are, quote, communist, unquote, according to Dick McCall, an aide to Senator Kerry. All those named in the affidavit had investigated Hull in connection with the covert Contra supply network. Hull said in an interview that he did, did that he did visit Glibri at the prison on March 29th, but he denied that he threatened the mercenary. Hull said he brought an affidavit for Glibri to sign, but claimed it did not mention communism. Quote, the affidavit said that Glibri took bribe money to accuse me of helping the Contra from, from Senator Kerry through Robert White's slush fund. Unquote. White former U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador, is now the president of the International Center for Development Policy based in Washington, D.C. After receiving the threat from Hull, Glibri called Mattis. Quote, Hull told Glibri he would ruin his family and that Glibri would be killed, Mattis told in these times, or Mats, perhaps, or Mates. Kerry's Senate office also confirmed Hull's threat against Glibri. Hull is trying to scare Peter, Dick McCall said. I wouldn't take the threat lightly, unquote. According to Mates, or Matt, yeah, I'm going to call him Mates, M-A-T-T-E-S, Hull also told Glibri that the CIA had killed Stephen Carr, a federal witness who died in Van Nuys, California in 1986, of a suspected cocaine overdose. But Hull denied that he had said the CIA killed Carr. He said he told Glibri that, quote, the communists killed Carr, unquote. Glibri is a key witness against Hull for his alleged involvement with the Contras. Before his arrest, Glibri spent five, week on Hull, five weeks on Hull's ranch training Contras. He and other congressional witnesses have provided investigators with the details of an extensive Contra military operation, complete with airstrips and weapons, de weapons depots, based on Hull's property on the Nicaraguan border. In an interview, Glibri said that Hull told him he was, quote, the CIA liaison to the Contras, unquote, and as such was receiving $10,000 a month from the National Security Council to support his Contra operation, unquote. Others in the Contra network have linked Hull to the CIA, but Hull denies having military ties to the Contras or to the U.S. government. Glibri also said that Hull was involved in a March 1985 arms shipment from Miami to the Contras. Questioned in Costa Rica by an assistant U.S. attorney, Glibri said he witnessed the arrival of the weapons to Hull's ranch. In November of 86, a federal grand jury was impaneled in Miami to investigate the shipment. And according to Mates, the House Judiciary Committee will soon travel to Costa Rica to talk to Glibri about the shipment. Mates said the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will also examine Hull's alleged connection with cocaine traffickers. During that investigation, drug smugglers are expected to testify that Hull allowed them to use airstrips he controlled in northern Costa Rica to refuel their cocaine-laden planes. Before his arrest for violating Costa Rica's neutrality, Glibri worked in 1985 as a Contra trainer on Hull's land with Stephen Carr. Mate said that Hull reportedly told Glibri, quote, You'll wind up dead like Stephen Carr. Don't you know the CIA killed Carr? In 1985, Carr said that Hull threatened his life. In a letter to his mother, he wrote, quote, I'm supposed to be shot. A guy by the name of Morgan Felipe Vidal, who worked for the FDN and John Hull, have been given orders to shoot me and Pete Glibri because we spoke out against John Hull. Although the Los Angeles coroner's office says Carr died of an accidental cocaine overdose, the coroner is unable to explain three needle-sized puncture marks on Carr's left elbow. 
The marks were made a short time before his death. Well, one uh, thing that one doesn't generally do, and I say this as someone who's not an intravenous drug user, but you usually don't stick a needle into your elbow, which is anybody who's ever bumped their elbow knows that's uh, neurologically one of the more sensitive parts of your arm, and uh, it's not something you just stick needles into. It's uh, not one of the, pre the preferred points of entry for intravenous drug users. So uh, the notion that he was shooting cocaine, which I expect, I haven't heard that suggested yet, but I'd be willing to bet that someone will suggest if the issue of the needle marks on his elbow ever comes out, that car, in fact, shot cocaine into his elbow, which is a, a bizarre and painful notion. The point here, though, that uh, at least according to several different people, John Hull had uh, information that the CIA did, in fact, kill Carr. Spokeswoman Kathy Furson's denials to the contrary, notwithstanding, it's worth thinking about, and it's worth thinking about the information that Stephen Carr will not now be able to provide both to the Christ Christic Institute and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee concerning the Contras financing of their military habit through cocaine smuggling. Uh, one of the things that, that springs to mind about that is in the uh, article, which we read part of just a few moments ago, uh, talking about the, the uh, Stephen's car's death, and, and uh, they, they mentioned that he supposedly woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and snorted a, what they, their words were, a, quote, fistful of cocaine and stumbled out in his driveway and died. Uh, last words being he told a friend of his that uh, he got paranoid and ate, I got too paranoid and ate it all, unquote. Um, it, uh, again, it could be... Uh, very possible that what he got, in fact, in his elbow was a uh, uh, some sort of a liquid uh, suspension of cocaine, and then the cocaine that he was snorting anyway was enough to push him over the top and leave him with a cocaine overdose. Again, it could have been anything. There are all, kinds, all yeah. kinds of toxins that could have been placed in the car in all kinds of ways, not necessarily leaving any trauma on the outside of the body. It's simply worth noting that, that people don't generally shoot drugs in their elbow. Well, and they mentioned specifically, one of the reasons that I mentioned that article is they mentioned specifically that he had been, quote, snorting cocaine. And there, again, there's a major difference between snorting cocaine and shooting it, and then there's even more of a major difference between shooting it and shooting it in your elbow. Also, how would he get the three puncture marks in his elbow if he'd been asleep? You know, yeah. It's not the usual kind of thing that happens. Have to be pretty darn coordinated. Okay, well, as long as we're talking about these kinds of things, and indeed we are on this Radio Free America on drugs and the drug connection to the Contragate scandal, uh, we're going to talk specifically a little bit about a very well-known plane at this point, uh, one of the very well-known planes in this particular uh, activity. And this article is from the San Francisco Chronicle for Friday, May 1st, 1987. The headline, Papers from Drug Plane Subpoenaed in Iran-Contra Probe. The article is by Joan Maurer and Larry Margasak of the AP, the Associated Press. Dateline, Washington. Iran-Contra investigator Lawrence Walsh has subpoenaed documents discovered on a DC-4 plane seized by federal drug enforcement agents in Florida last month, a U.S. government source says. The documents, which are believed to belong to the plane's pilot, Frank Moss, include the telephone number of a U.S. intelligence operation in Honduras, according to another government source. Both sources spoke Thursday on condition they not be identified. Some of the documents, obtained by the Associated Press, also give the names and home telephone numbers of top Contra leaders fighting to overthrow the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. Walsh, the independent counsel investigating the secret sale of U.S. weapons to Iran and diversion of pay payment to the Contras, issued subpoenas early this week, earlier this week, one federal source said. The source added that Walsh ha had, quote, FBI agents working on this case, unquote. Staff members on special Iran-Contra committees in the House and Senate also have looked at the papers as part of a wider investigation into allegations that crews who ferried supplies to the Contras also brought drugs into the United States, while U.S. intelligence of officials looked the other way. The DC-4, confiscated March 24th in Charlotte County, Florida, had been sought since April 1985 when 18 people were indicted in a drug smuggling operation. The plane was, quote, purchased with drug money for the intent of smuggling drugs, unquote, said Jack Hook, a Drug Enforcement Administration spokesman in Miami. No drugs, skipping down in the article, no drugs were found on the plane, but agents discovered maps, manifests, customs forms, and other papers, including a calendar from March 7, 1987, and a list of telephone numbers that appear to be from the same book. Agents believe the calendar and other documents found on the plane belonged to Moss because the pilot said he owned everything aboard the aircraft. Moss is president of an air cargo corporation, Hondu Karib Cargo Incorporated of Georgetown, Grand Cayman Island. Skipping a little further down. 
The March, March 7, 1987 calendar entry lists the names of Adolfo Calero, head of the Nicaraguan Democratic Force, or FDN, the largest rebel army. Another entry under the same date says, Saw Juan Gomez. Gomez is the chief of Contra Air Operations. So let's skip back just one more time, just to make this is absolutely clear. Uh, a plane used in uh, drug smuggling operations, seized by federal drug enforcement agents, a DC-4, uh, belonging to Frank Moss, uh, is filled with documents linking Moss to the Iran, uh, the, excuse me, the Contra uh, supply network, and specifically to people like Adolfo Calero at the, at the top of the FDN, and Juan Gomez, also a heavy player. Um, again, none of this information we might mention, as far as I know, has surfaced anywhere in the Contragate hearings at this point. This is one of the reasons, of course, that we're doing this Radio Free America, but it's rather shocking um, when we're spending all this time listening to Fawn Hall talk about what a fine man Oliver North is, that nobody is standing up saying, yes, well, Fawn, what do you know about the DC-4s and the cocaine coming down on the Contra Supply Network? Even if Fawn knows nothing, somebody ought to. Yeah, again, the... The turnaround, I guess one could say, where we begin with Eugene Hassenfuss going down in Nicaragua, as it turns out, his plane has been used for an alleged drug smuggling sting against the Sandinistas. In fact, the people involved appear to have been connected to the Contras and not the Sandinistas. A lot of information comes out from a number of convicted drug smugglers maintaining that, in fact, they were heavily involved with the Contra supply operation. Stephen Carr provided a lot of information in that regard, which was reported both by private and congressional investigators to check out. Stephen Carr turns up dead under ambiguous circumstances. There are reports that he was killed by the CIA, and even though many people have dismissed those reports, the puncture marks in his elbow certainly bear some investigating. When seen against the deaths of Barry Adler Seal and quite possibly Donald Aronow as well, an intimate of George Bush, uh, a person who was involved with providing a custom service with boats to prevent drug smuggling, also a person who moved in the same kinds of circles as George Morales, himself a championship boater and a person who claims to have been supplying arms to the Contras and then bringing drugs back into the United States in order to help finance the operation. These are some of the events that should be evaluated against the... the, the these are some of the major elements to be evaluated as we proceed with our uh, broadcast. We're going to take another musical break now, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to continue with the, the Medellin cartel, one of the elements involved with this, and specifically we're going to take a look at a couple of speculative elements vis-a-vis -vis the Medellin cartel. Uh, unlike a lot of Radio Free America shows, which are at a, a relative historical distance from much of the information that we're analyzing, Obviously, there are a lot of open ends still in the Iran-Contra investigation. So the, what, what, among the things we will be presenting in this series, and we may, we'll probably do an update show at some point in order to bring people literally up to date on the information since uh, Radio Free America 31, the third in our projected series, uh, there are a lot of open ends. And we're going to be talking about the extradition of Carlos Leda Rivas, a member of the Medellin cartel, and also the pizza connection case. And we're going to be examining what possible connections there may be between some of these things and the Contra arm smuggling and drug smuggling operations, which we've been looking at so far. Don't go away. This is Nip Tuck. Dave Emery and I will return with more Radio Free America after this musical break right here on KFJC. <laughs> And thus we return, we in this case being Dave Emery and Nip Tuck, in the studios at KFJC with Radio Free America number 29. It's getting hard to keep track of all these numbers. Number 29 being the first part of our dissertation, our compilation, our compendium, our omnibus, whatever you want to call it. Um, all right, everybody step to the back of the omnibus on... It could be called an omnibus. <laughs> that too. On the Contra Gate slash Iran Gate scandals, namely the first of our three uh, arbitrary uh, sub-routines, the first one being the drug angle, the second one will focus on the terrorism story, and the third will be on the cover-up. Tonight we're talking about the drugs angle, and uh, many and various have been the ways in which drugs have surfaced in the story so far, largely, of course, um, in the use of drugs as a funding mechanism, as a, uh, a sort of a, a, a black bank account to uh, to fund the Contras, and as part of the eternal uh, eternal pairing with uh, illegal arms sales that seem to be so dear to the mercenary and clandestine intelligence right in our country and in other, uh, especially Western nations. 
And uh, we've been looking at a variety of things, including most recently in the last hour, a number of, uh, of witnesses and potential witnesses in the Iran Contragate hearings who have caught sudden cases of dead. Adler Berry Seal, of course, leading off the show. Donald Aronow, noted speedboat manufacturer, intimate of George Bush, and uh, himself uh, gunned down in a uh, drug, uh, drug dealing uh, execution style killing. And uh, most recently we talked about Stephen Carr. And we talked about others like George Morales who are in jail and uh, a variety of things. So there's a lot of folks talking, but very few of them talking on the stands. Well, we're going to be taking a look at now the possible connections, and we say possible connections, between the Contra supply efforts, drug smuggling, and a couple of other cases which are being, which are, which are under investigation or have recently been completed. We're going to take a look at the investigation, the trial attendant on the death of Bar Adler Barry Seal. We're going to take a look at the extradition of Carlos Lide Reves, a member of the Medellin cartel. And we're going to take a look at the pizza connection case and uh, some possible connections between that and the Iran-Contra Iran scandal, specifically to the drug smuggling connections to the Contra supply effort. Reading now from the San Francisco Chronicle of Wednesday, November 19th of 1986. It's an AP story, Dateline Miami, headlined, Nine Indicted in Slaying of Drug Informant. It's about the trial in the assassination of Adler Barry Seal. A fugitive drug lord, a Sandinista official, and a former Colombian senator are among nine members of a smuggling cartel responsible for the murder of a major informant last winter, according to a federal indictment unsealed here yesterday. The ring, quote, controlled massive cocaine manufacturing and distribution network within the Medellin cartel, according to the indictment. The ring imported more than 58 tons of cocaine, it said. None of the nine men indicted is in custody. I would say that that has changed since this article was written, because one of them, as we're going to see, was extradited during the course of this investigation, as shortly after this article was written. One of the suspects is accused Colombian drug trafficker Jorge Ocoa Vasquez. Adler Barry Seal, the informant, had been scheduled in February to testify against Ocoa in a drug case that was pending in Miami. Another suspect is Federico Vaughn, said by the U.S. government to be an assistant to the Minister of the Interior in Nicaragua. He had been indicted in July of 1984 on drug trafficking charges. Vaughn, according to the indictment, used his position to help set the cartel up to help the cartel set up cocaine conversion laboratories and distribution plants in Nicaragua. Let me read that sentence again. Vaughn, according to the indictment, used his position to help the cartel set up cocaine conversion laboratories and distribution plants in Nicaragua. Also indicted is Carlos Leder, L-E-H-D-E-R, a former Colombian senator accused, by a be accused of using a Bahamian island for a drug way station. Now recall that and, and despite the allegations uh, repeated in that article about Federico Vaughn and his son Anista involvement with the Medellin cartel, as we saw earlier in the broadcast. In fact, all of the people around Adler Barry Seal and his sting operation seem to go back to the Contras, and indeed, the gun shop from which his murder weapon was purchased was a major supply station for the Contras, the Coutine gun shop. I'm going to read just a short segment of an article here. Uh, from the Dallas Morning News for Sunday, April 13th, 1986. The article was originally uh, provided to us by Ted Rubenstein. Um, we've got uh, just a short segment here about Carlos Leder, otherwise known as Carlos Leder Rivas, uh, with the dual last names often common in uh, Latin countries, and uh, some of his interesting ideas about uh, what uh, his involvement in politics should be. Now remember, this is a fellow who supposedly was helping the Sandinistas, the dreaded communists, and in fact... As we're going to see, his political affiliations appear to go in an opposite direction. Another reputed drug czar, it says in the middle of this article, another reputed drug czar, 34-year-old Carlos Leder, has formed his own neo-fascist political party and recently proposed to President Betancourt that the government and the drug traffickers work together to build a, quote, 500,000-man army to defend the sovereignty of the country from U.S. and Russian imperialism, unquote. Um, and uh, although it's not mentioned in great depth in this article, in fact, uh, it was a neo-fascist political party that Leder had formed uh, with explicitly neo-fascist aims of a variety of sorts. Um, again, the man who supposedly was working in tandem with the, uh, the evil communist oppressors in Nicaragua to uh, subvert the United States by the, in, in uh, the transshipment of drugs. Now, bear in mind, the 
uh, attribution of the Adlerberry Seal assassination to the Medellin cartel. While it does appear that people affiliated with Medellin were involved, the indications appear to go in the opposite direction, as we indicated earlier in the broadcast. In fact, the possibility of CIA involvement in the assassination of Adlerberry Seal uh, is raised in this particular article. Uh, this, this article coming from the New York Times of Tuesday, April 28th of 1987. This is an article. This, this particular article is headlined: "Slaying Attributed to, co to Cocaine Cartel." The reputed leaders of the world's leading cocaine smuggling organization ordered the assassination of a key witness in a government case to protect an imprisoned leader of the Colombian-based Medellin cocaine cartel. A prosecutor told a jury today. In her opening statement in the trial in district court here of three Colombian nationals accused of the murder of Adler Barry Seal. Assistant District Attorney Prem Burns said the cartel placed a $500,000 bounty on the life of Mr. Seal to prevent him from testifying further against Jorge Acoa and the Medellin cartel. But Richard Sharpstein, who represents the defendant Miguel Velez, said in his opening statement that Mr. Seal, while working for the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, also was working for the Central Intelligence Agency and running guns to the rebels in Nicaragua. Mr. Seal had many enemies who might have wanted him dead, Mr. Sharpstein said. Mr. Velez, Luis Carlos Quintero Cruz, and Bernardo Antonio Vasquez could face Louisiana's electric chair if convicted of first-degree murder. Mr. Seal had said that he had earned more than $50 million while smuggling cocaine, marijuana, and methaquilone from South America. When caught by DEA agents, he became a witness for the government and later flaunted his activities as an informant on local television in Baton Rouge, his hometown. And again, bearing in mind the interesting contra connections to his slaying. It, uh, his, his, or the, rather not Badler Barry Seals, but one of the statements of one of the defense attorneys in that case should be borne in mind. Again, the linkage between the drug cases, the contra Iran gate scam, and uh, death threats and actual death being visited on witnesses continue. Uh, this is a short article originally published for our purposes in the San Jose Mercury News for Tuesday, March 17, 1987. The headline, Death Threats Reported in Drug Cases. Dateline, Washington. It's a Washington Post story. Federal officials in Miami are taking extraordinary security precautions, including 24-hour bodyguards for the U.S. Attorney and the deployment of a police SWAT team at the federal courthouse in response to death threats from Colombian drug traffickers, according to law enforcement sources. The threats, picked up by U.S. intelligence officials about two weeks ago, were made against U.S. Attorney Leon B. Kellner, K-E-L-L-N-E-R, an unnamed judge and a Drug Enforcement Administration official, the sources said. Skipping on down. The threats come as Kellner's office is prosecuting several high-profile cases involving cocaine smuggling from Colombia. Several of the defendants are tied loosely to the Medellin cartel, an international cocaine smuggling ring believed to be responsible for 80% of the cocaine brought into the United States. So, again, uh, whether the, these people are being threatened uh, because of their involvement in the Medellin cartel or something else remains to be seen. We saw Leon Kellner's name crop up a little earlier in the broadcast. Some of his reluctance to pursue some of the allegations of contra drug smuggling may have something, this is obviously speculative, may have something to do with the fact that he has received some of the same threats and is undoubtedly aware that uh, some of those threats have uh, been carried out on other individuals, notably Barry Adler Seal and quite possibly Donald Aronow as well. One of the interesting things to contemplate uh, against the background of the Iran-Contra scandal and the Contra drug supplying efforts in particular concerns the extradition of Carlo Lede Rivas, one of the suspects in the Medellin prosecution during the course of the investigation. Reading now from the San Jose Mercury News of Friday, February 6th of 1987. It's a Mercury News Wire Services story headlined, Agents on Alert After Extradition of Drug Kingpin. Federal drug agents and their families throughout the world were warned Thursday to be extra vigilant to guard against possible retaliation resulting from the extradition to the United States of Colombian cocaine kingpin Carlos Lede Rivas. Officials throughout government praised the courage they said had been shown by Colombian President Virgilio Barco for moving against Lede, with Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Joseph Biden, Jr., Democrat of Delaware, saying that Barco risked being shot dead, unquote. Lader, who was captured Wednesday after a gun battle between his bodyguards and Colombian soldiers at his remote ranch in northwestern Colombia, was ordered held under extreme security measures Thursday in Tampa, Florida, for a hearing Monday in Jacksonville. 
According to the Drug Enforcement Administration, later is associated with Paulo Escobar, Jorge Acoa, and Fabio Acoa in the Medellin cartel. It's named for the organization based in Medellin, Colombia, that is responsible, responsible for 80% of the cocaine smuggled into the United States. That figure, 80%, is worth bearing in mind. Some more follow-up on the background of Carlos Lede Rivas. Now, remember, this guy is supposedly cooperating with the Sandinistas. Skipping down on that same Mercury News article from February 6th of 87, law enforcement sources say that Lader stands out as one of the more bizarre and flamboyant characters in an underworld drug network known for its extreme behavior. They say that in the late 1970s, Lader purchased an entire island in the Bahamas where he based his drug trafficking activities. He built a 3,300-foot runway there protected by radar, armed traffickers, and Doberman attack dogs. While he lived in the Bahamas, investigators say... He owned a yacht and 19 cars and spent time with his many female friends at his private disco. Later, 37, embraces a peculiar political philosophy, considering himself an admirer of Adolf Hitler, as well as, well as a supporter of some left-wing causes, sources said. So uh, it's uh, worth thinking about the ambiguous, at best, political affiliations of Later. More about Later. At a party convention, the background to the podium on which Later appeared was a huge photograph of Later flanked by pictures of Hitler and Mussolini. So it's worth thinking about uh, just which side of the fence later Rivas is playing on here. And remember, he was extradited in the middle of the Iran-Contra scandal and in the middle of investigations not only into the, inv the assassination of Barry Seal, but also another case called the Pizza Connection case. Now what we're going to do is take a look at two Pizza Connections and speculate about the fact that they may really be part of the same operation. We're going to read an article here from the Washington Post, first published in December, uh, excuse me, in February 3rd, 1987. The article is headlined, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, research credit for this goes to Mae Russell, by the way. Uh, the article is headlined, Organized Crime Ties Found Here, namely Washington. Pizza Parlors Linked to Colombian Drug Ring is the subhead. The article is by Nancy Lewis and Carlisle Murphy of the Washington Post. An alleged cocaine distribution network that prosecutors say operated out of several pizza restaurants in Washington and suburban Virginia has links to organized crime and one of the world's largest drug cartels. Court documents and testimony show. It is the first time officials have found a widespread pattern of organized crime activity in, in the Washington area, and only the second time authorities have linked drug trafficking here to one of the major Colombian drug exporting cartels. Authorities said the alleged network, the most extensive they have ever uncovered in the Washington area, stretches from Columbia, where cocaine is harvested, to the parking lots of suburban Virginia, where middlemen deliver pounds of the drug hidden in dog food bags and grocery sacks. It is extended to drug retailers who sold customers cocaine along with their pizza. Although he refused to comment on the so-called pizza case, U.S. Attorney Joseph E. DeGeneva said, quote, Highly sophisticated criminal elements, unquote, including traditional organized crime, are now moving into the area because of the, quote, booming drug market, especially for cocaine because of the huge profits to be made. Small, local organizations traditionally have dominated area drug trafficking. The only previous organized crime links in Washington were found in the 1940s and 50s in connection with gambling, especially numbers operations. FBI Special Agent James L. Glass, Jr., who directed the eight-month investigation of the alleged drug, tr drug ring, testified yesterday in U.S. District Court in Washington that Alfredo the Butcher Torriello, age 43, who was charged with conspiracy to distribute cocaine, is, quote, an associate of New York's Genovese organized crime family. Glass testified that Torriello is not an actual member of the organized crime group, but, quote, works under the umbrella of the organization and enjoys its benefits, unquote, including access to money for attorneys and protection from members of organized crime. Torriello is nicknamed the Butcher, Glass said, because of his work in New York collecting debts for organized crime extortionists. Torriello operates Alfredo and Miriam Pizza, Pizzeria at 1025 Vermont Avenue. In earlier testimony, Glass identified Benjamino Centurino, age 48, an owner of the K Street Eatery in the district as a, quote, good soldier of the Sicilian Mafia, which he said is separate from the American La Cosa Nostra, but organized in similar hierarchy with bosses, captains, and soldiers. He said Giuseppe Luciano Cotone, 
age 35, associated with several pizza delight restaurants in Washington and Virginia, also has Sicilian Mafia connections. Centurino and Cotoni, who all allegedly sold between June 1986 and January of 87 a total of 11 kilograms of cocaine, more than 24 pounds, to an FBI undercover agent for $406,500, have been indicted in Virginia on federal drug conspiracy charges and also have been charged in the district with conspiracy to distribute cocaine and heroin. Skipping down. An affidavit filed in U.S. District Court in Alexandria states that the FBI thinks that profits from Katoni's alleged drug trafficking were being used to buy additional pizza restaurants in the Washington area and in Virginia. Glass testified yesterday that organized crime often used businesses such as pizza restaurants, with mostly cash, tra cash transactions, to launder illicit money. Authorities allege that the network comprised two dozen persons who included drug importers who brought hundreds of pounds of cocaine into the country and stashed large quantities of cocaine in houses and apartments in Virginia and dealers who sold quantities of half ounces or less. Court documents allege the importers were part of the Medellin drug cartel, headed by Jorge Luis Ochoa Vasquez of Colombia, considered one of the world's largest drug kingpins. Ochoa Vasquez also has been named as being directly in charge of a 1983 guns for drugs transfer at an airfield in Barranquilla, Colombia, that the FBI has been told involved a cargo plane with the markings of Southern Air Transport, the former CIA airline involved in the Iran-Contra affair. Ochoa Vasquez and his two brothers were among the five Colombians indicted in August by a federal grand jury in Miami in the largest federal drug trafficking indictment in U.S. history. They have not been apprehended. Okay, going back again to go over the most important part here, we've got um, this pizza parlor case in Washington and, and Virginia, this pizza connection case of uh, cocaine distribution network. Now, this is important because the other co pizza connection case we're going to talk about is a heroin uh, distribution network. Although it also distributed cocaine. It was described as lesser amounts of cocaine. As well, yes. Good point. Uh, but now this particular one, again involving the Sicilian Mafia and uh, involving um, specifically the, the use of pizza parlors to lo launder drug funds, um, is tied, according to this affidavit, um, specifically with the Medellin drug cartel, cartel that the importers, uh, the folks involved in this, were part of the Medellin cartel. And the Medellin cartel, of course, we talked about at great length, the Ochoa, the Vasquez's, or the Ochoa's, excuse me, and their involvement with Southern Air Transport and the Guns for Drugs transfers in 1983 and others, um, and the indictments that proceeded from those. So again, now we have one pizza connection case where we begin to see perhaps how some of the vast amounts of money are laundered that are then later turned back into uh, guns again, in many cases, um, shipped back down, turned again into drugs when they reach Latin America, and so on. So the main connection here is we have organized crime, the American Mafia, distributing Medellin cartel cocaine from pizzerias in the Washington area. Now bear in mind that the connections of the Medellin cartel to the Contra supply effort, and apparently the Medellin operation was helping that effort, and the Southern Air Transport connection detailed in that uh, article. The question that we're asking, basically, is that pizza connection that we just talked about connected with another pizza connection drug smuggling case that was going on at, at the same time that that revealed. And uh, the main, one of the main names to consider here also, again, is that of George Bush, as well as former White House Chief of Staff Donald Regan. The reasons for that will be discussed at the end of this particular article. This one, uh, research credit for this also goes to Mae Russell, the greatest researcher in this field, and Mae's been working with us for some time on these programs, and she got the following article for us. This is from the Washington Post of March 3rd of 1987. It's by Margot Hornblower of the Washington Post. It's headlined, 18 Guilty in Pizza Connection Trial, Dateline, New York. Eighteen men were convicted today of operating an international heroin and cocaine ring, <coughs> excuse me, that distributed more than $1.6 billion in drugs through pizza parlors in the Northeast and Midwest. The convictions of the men, who include former leaders of the Sicilian Mafia and the New York-based Bonanno crime family, follow the convictions late last year of the members of a ruling Mafia conviction, uh, commission. It is a tremendous victory in the effort to crush the Mafia, U.S. Attorney Rudolph W. Giuliani said. Five years ago, nobody would have thought it possible to convict the head of the Sicilian Mafia and the head of a major part of an American Mafia family. He added, quote, 
The impact on the mafia of these cases has been devastating. If this continues, there's not going to be a mafia, unquote. The 17-month trial, known as the Pizza Connection, unquote, was one of the longest criminal cases in federal court history. It involved 15,000 exhibits, surveillance in the United States and abroad, and testimony from 250 witnesses that filled 41,000 pages of transcript. One of the original defendants, Gaetano Mazzara, M-A-Z-Z-A-R-A, was murdered in an apparent gangland rub-out in December. His bludgeoned body was found in a garbage bag on a Brooklyn street. Another defendant, Pietro Alfano, 51, an Oregon, Illinois pizzeria owner, was shot on a Greenwich Village street last month. Law enforcement officers have speculated that the killings were prompted by a feud between Sicilian and American defendants. Six men, including a reputed captain of the Gambino Mafia family, were arrested after the second killing. Under the scheme, according to testimony, morphine paste was brought from Turkey to Sicily where it was converted in laboratories to heroin. The heroin was smuggled to the United States and distributed through pizzerias in New York, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And this next sentence is very important. Lesser amounts of cocaine were imported from Latin America. Profits from the massive decade-long operation were laundered through Swiss and Caribbean banks and accounts with Merrill Lynch and E.F. Hutton brokerage firms, according to testimony. Now, the really important sections of this uh, article, we're going to take a look at the two killings of defendants during the course of the trial. Both of, both of these killings, incidentally, went on after the breaking of the Iran contract scandal. Well, and the important parts here are that this operation also involved cocaine. We're wondering, and the question we're asking here, we obviously don't have the final answer, is this part of the same operation as the Medellin Southern Air Transport CIA connected operation in Washington, D.C. that we were just talking about? And the names Merrill Lynch, obviously the full name of the firm is Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, and E.F. Hutton are key here. These are two of the firms through which the Pizza Connection profits were, were laundered. And one of the reasons we're asking about the connections between these is that the head of Merrill Lynch during uh, the time that it was being used to launder some of the heroin Pizza Connection op uh, money, this connected with the Gambino crime family, is that the head of that was Donald Regan, for many years White House Chief of Staff. The head of E.F. Hutton's brokerage outfit at this time was Scott Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. Scott Pierce is George Bush's brother-in-law, and again, bearing in mind the many allegations of George Bush's connection to the drug smuggling and the uh, Contra supply effort. This is another in the excellent series of articles written by the authors Dennis Bernstein and Vince Bielski. Uh, there, many of their stories have been carried by the San Francisco Examiner here in the Bay Area. This particular article, however, was, in, uh, was carried in In These Times, specifically the issue of In These Times, uh, the week of April 15th through 21st of 1987. So April 15th through 21st, 87, In These Times, Vince Bielski and Dennis Bernstein. This article is headlined, A Whirlwind of Death Threats and Wild Accusations Swirls Around Contragate. A key figure in the covert arms supply network threatened a congressional witness with death if the witness did not sign an inflammatory statement against a U.S. senator and others investigating the Iran-Contra scandal, a congressional source told in these times. John Hull, an American with dual citizenship in Costa Rica, delivered the threat to Peter Glibbery, G-L-I-B-B-E-R-Y, a British mercenary. Glibbery is imprisoned in Costa Rica for his involvement with the Contras fighting the Nicaraguan government. On Sunday, March 29th, in the crowded visiting area of La Reforma Prison in Costa Rica, Hull told Glibri he would be killed if he refused to sign an affidavit declaring that Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, Miami Public Defender John Matez, M-A-T-T-E-S, and American reporters Tony Avigan and Martha Honey are, quote, communist, unquote, according to Dick McCall, an aide to Senator Kerry. Committee concerning the Contras' financing of their military habit through cocaine smuggling. Uh, one of the things that, that springs to mind about that is in the uh, article, which we read part of just a few moments ago, uh, talking about the, the uh, Stevens car's death, and, and uh, they, they mentioned that he supposedly woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and snorted a, what they, their words were a, quote, fistful of cocaine and stumbled out in his driveway and died. Uh, last words being he told a friend of his that uh, he got paranoid and ate, I got too paranoid and ate it all, unquote. Um, it, uh, again, it could be 
Uh, very possible that what he got, in fact, in his elbow was a uh, uh, some sort of a liquid uh, suspension of cocaine, and then the cocaine that he was snorting anyway was enough to push him over the top and leave him with a cocaine overdose. Again, it could have been anything. Just there are speculation. All kinds, all yeah. kinds of toxins that could have been placed in the car in all kinds of ways, not necessarily leaving any trauma on the outside of the body. It's simply worth noting that, that people don't generally shoot drugs in their elbow. Well, and they mentioned specifically, one of the reasons that I mentioned that article is they mentioned specifically that he had been, quote, snorting cocaine. And there, again, there's a major difference between snorting cocaine and shooting it, and then there's even more of a major difference between shooting it and shooting it in your elbow. Also, how would he get the three puncture marks in his elbow if he'd been asleep? You know, it's, yeah. it's not the usual kind of thing that happened. Have to be pretty darn coordinated. Okay, well, as long as we're talking about these kinds of things, and as indeed we are on this Radio Free America on drugs and the drug connection to the Contragate scandal, uh, we're going All those named in the affidavit had investigated Hull in connection with the Covert Contra Supply Network. Hull said in an interview that he did, that he did visit Glibri at the prison on March 29th, but he denied that he threatened the mercenary. Hull said he brought an affidavit for Glibri to sign, but claimed it did not mention communism. Quote, the affidavit said that Glibri took bribe money to accuse me of helping the Contra from, from Senator Kerry through Robert White's slush fund, unquote. White, former U.S. ambassador to El Salvador, is now the president of the International Center for Development Policy based in Washington, D.C. After receiving the threat from Hull, Glibri called Mattis, quote, Hull told Glibri he would ruin his family and that Glibri would be killed, Mattis told in these times, or Mats, perhaps, or Mates. Kerry's Senate office also confirmed Hull's threat against Glibri. Hull is trying to scare Peter, Dick McCall said. I wouldn't take the threat lightly, unquote. According to Mates, or Matt, I'm going to call him Mates, M-A-T-T-E-S, Hull also told Glibri that the CIA had killed Stephen Carr, a federal witness who died in Van Nuys, California in 1986, of a suspected cocaine overdose. But Hull denied that he had said the CIA killed Carr. He said he told Glibri that, quote, the communists killed Carr, unquote. Glibri is a key witness against Hull for his alleged involvement with the Contras. Before his arrest, Glibri spent five, week on Hull, five weeks on Hull's ranch training Contras. Carr. Don't you know the CIA killed Carr? In 1985, Carr said that Hull threatened his life. In a letter to his mother, he wrote, quote, I'm supposed to be shot. A guy by the name of Morgan Felipe Vidal, who worked for the FDN and John Hull, have been given orders to shoot me and Pete Glibri because we spoke out against John Hull. Although the Los Angeles coroner's office says Carr died of an accidental cocaine overdose, the coroner is unable to explain three needle-sized puncture marks on Carr's left elbow. The marks were made a short time before his death. Well, one uh, thing that one doesn't generally do, and I say this as someone who's not an intravenous drug user, but you usually don't stick a needle into your elbow, which is anybody who's ever bumped their elbow knows that's uh, neurologically one of the more sensitive parts of your arm, and uh, it's not something you just stick needles into. It's uh, not one of the, pre the preferred points of entry for intravenous drug users. So uh, the notion that he was shooting cocaine, which I expect, I haven't heard that suggested yet, but I'd be willing to bet that someone will suggest if the issue of the needle marks on his elbow ever comes out, that Carr, in fact, shot cocaine into his elbow, which is a, a bizarre and painful notion. The point here, though, that uh, at least according to several different people, John Hull had uh, information that the CIA did, in fact, kill Carr. Spokeswoman Kathy Furson's denials to the contrary, notwithstanding, it's worth thinking about, and it's worth thinking about the information that Stephen Carr will not now be able to provide both to the Christ Christic Institute and the Senate Foreign Relations he and other congressional witnesses have provided investigators with the details of an extensive Contra military operation, complete with airstrips and weapons, de weapons depots, based on Hull's property on the Nicaraguan border. In an interview, Glibri said that Hull told him he was, quote, the CIA liaison to the Contras, unquote, and as such was receiving $10,000 a month from the National Security Council to support his Contra operation, unquote. Others in the Contra network have linked Hull to the CIA but Hull denies having military ties to the Contras or to the U.S. government. Glibri also said that Hull was involved in a March 1985 arms shipment from Miami to the Contras. Questioned in Costa Rica by an assistant U.S. attorney, Glibri said he witnessed the arrival of the weapons to Hull's ranch. In November of 86, a federal grand jury was impaneled in Miami to investigate the shipment. And according to Mates, the House Judiciary Committee will soon travel to Costa Rica to talk to Glibri about the shipment. Mate said the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will also examine Hull's alleged connection with cocaine traffickers. 
During that investigation, drug smugglers are expected to testify that Hull allowed them to use airstrips he controlled in northern Costa Rica to refuel their cocaine-laden planes. Before his arrest for violating Costa Rica's neutrality, Glibri worked in 1985 as a Contra trainer on Hull's land with Stephen Carr. Mate said that Hull reportedly told Glibri, quote, You'll wind up dead like Stephen Carr.